Awesome. Thank you. I don't know how, uh, whether I can actually give a talk using Mac in the Linux room, but I hope it still will be fine. Uh, my attempt to make a joke. I still, is Amigo OS is a real thing? Anyways, I um, think we could get started. Is it good enough? I think we're ready, more or less. I mean, we have plenty of time. We're not in a rush. Um, I think we're more or less good. Awesome. Yeah, my time is actually already ticking. Awesome. Let's get started. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Dmitry Vinik, and today, as you can see, we're going to talk about web testing. Whether it's going to be modern or not, it's up to you to judge. That being said, I hope to kind of uh, talk about some of the pains we all face when we do web testing and potentially, uh, you know, introduce you to some ideas of how to improve that and uh, remove that pain. So, I'm going to be in old fashioned today as well and not even use a clicker because my battery died. So, I'll use the, uh, the keyboard. But, all right. So, first and foremost, I always like to establish the goals for any talk I, I give because then you can make a conscious choice whether it was to stay in this session or look at any other awesome sessions that go in, in parallel with mine. So, first and foremost, what we'll discuss today would be choosing the right test context, basically figuring out where your tests should reside and what your testing team or the engineers who write the tests uh, should focus on the most. Then, um, primary focus would be again on the fact that we need to choose the right level of testing. Maybe it's not a good idea just do end-to-end, -end, even though it's for the web. Maybe you can do some unit testing or integration or server le service level testing. So we're going to discuss that point. And last but not least, of course, is to keep it practical. I hope that you'll be able to potentially look up a new tool or a new approach to testing. It's not going to be a tutorial about how to use any individual tool. I kind of uh, go over today. Some of the things I'm sure you've seen in the past, the things that I'll be highlighting is that the learning curve, how much investment it might be for your team to basically switch your test focus from what you used to do towards something that might be better, rather than giving you step-by-step -step instruction how to use a certain framework or such. So it'll be more conceptual, but also hopefully practical to some extent. So without further ado, let's go into more details. And a good question to ask is how do we usually test our web or just any sort of applications? Of course, you have to bring up so-called test pyramid when we talk about testing. And a test pyramid is well-known approach to testing. Obviously, there have been some discussions over this shape, but in general, standard, um, it's that in the bottom of the pyramid, you have a unit tests, which represents the fact that the width of this level represents the fact that you're supposed to have the highest number of those unit tests. Whether they're true or not, it's uh, up to you to judge, of course. But that being said, on this pyramid level, the flow and the standards and principles this level should represent there's just three of them. First is that it's usually the cheapest tests to write and to maintain compared to other levels. They are the fastest. They are the ones that intended to give a quick feedback to your developers that work on a feature or on a bug, kind of a real-time feedback loop. Rather than having a regression suite, that's more of a making sure you haven't broken anything with your change list. This one is actually having kind of a, a pair programming, a pair tester along with the developer. But that being said, unfortunately, it gives you a low level of fidelity, or in other terms, the confidence level and overall software given by just the unit tests, it's fairly low. You can't just release the software with the unit tests alone. I wish we could, but we can't. Then it's more elaborate integration tests. This level, whether you're going to call it service level tests or, again, the integration, it just ultimately the idea is that it involves multiple units of work tested together, whether it's the integration process or maybe some live parts of your application actually running and can be tested. There are many different variations, but ultimately it's one step above the unit tests. And of course, on the top, and something that we're going to talk about the most today is the end-to-end -end tests. And those are more elaborate in regards that the, um, the cost list, in a sense, of developing cost and maintenance cost, of course. Fixing the Selenium tests can be a pain, of course. They are the slowest, so that's why developers usually hate running them. Uh, that's why we let our 
a kind of a, a you know um, continuous integration servers to do that for us. Nobody wants to run them in real life in the real time because they won't give you feedback quick enough. I can't wait for 10 minutes to figure out if my change fixed an issue. I want to be able to test it right away, and the uh, end-to-end -end tests won't help me with that, unfortunately, for the most part. But it gives you a high level of fidelity. The fact that it's such a small level in sense of comparing to the previous two represents the fact you should only write the end-to-end -end tests for user-centric scenarios. So basically only real-life cases that your customer in interacts with and goes through on a daily basis. I mean, all of this is very ide idealistic. It doesn't work that way in real life. And that's why when we talk about how do we usually test web in particular, we have to talk about real life test pyramids. And those don't look like pyramids whatsoever. The first real test pyramid is called ice cream cone, and I'll talk about that in a second. A second one called hourglass, and the last one is a cupcake. Fairly sweet anti-patterns, but unfortunately they're not that sweet to work with. And Let's look at the ice cream cone first. That's, I'm sure you've seen it in the past, you've heard of it. Ultimately, you can also call it a reverse test pyramid. That's what I'm working with the most. Uh, big enterprise companies usually end up in this position. Whether the manual, the icing on the ice cone is real or not, the fact that you still have a major manual team is true or not for your team, the fact that you have a reverse pyramid where you have the fewest number of uni unit tests, more service tests, and even more end-to-end -end tests usually represents the problem that many companies face where you would have, for example, a uh, regular cause of that, you would have two separate teams. One does development, then you have like a fence bet between the, uh, the two teams, and another team does the testing. So developers finish the feature, they basically grab this ball of feature of work, they throw it over the fence to the testing team. Testing team now works with that. And testing team is judged based on the amount of tests, the number of tests they write. And the, primarily they're writing the end-to-end -end tests. As a result, we end up with having a large number of end-to-end -end tests covering every single edge case, everything that we can ever encounter in production, even if it doesn't worth it. Because they don't really, they're not valued or measured by is it fast enough? Is it costly or not? Because they've been hired most of the time to maintain and work with those tests. That's their primary job, unfortunately. In some companies, especially in the US, that are moving towards having engineers and testers writing all the tests, all the test suites, whether it's end-to-end, -end integration, unit tests, they still face the same problem. And the problem there is people take testing for granted and they think, oh, we can you know, we have to focus on learning how to code. We don't have to focus on how to write tests and when to write tests. So people just write tests for everything. And as a result, we end up having that many UI tests. That's a common problem, unfortunately. And that's something we're going to talk about today. The hourglass is similar in the sense that you still have a lot of UI tests or end-to-end -end tests, whatever you want to call it. You have a fewer service tests. That's, that's okay. Uh, but you still have a lot, uh, at least you have a large number of unit tests. Usually people end up with this when they are trying to integrate test-driven development, but they kind of stop on the unit test level and then they say, all the old practices we had with a bunch of end-to-end -end tests, let's just leave it as is. So you end up with TDD kind of team, test-driven development team, does a bunch of unit tests, forget about service tests, and still do the same old thing with let's write Selenium WebDriver for every single thing. That's, again, that's an unfortunate anti-pattern. And the last thing I want to talk about, this one is more kind of a, it's realistic, with that being said, it's, I would say, exaggeration sometimes, but ultimately what it represents is that you have lots of duplications. Teams don't interact between each other. It's especially apparent in, in those organizations I've mentioned where you have different responsibilities between uh, departments. You have a team that's responsible for feature, a team responsible for testing and they don't communicate, and as a result, developers might have already tested this feature, this, this unit of work via integration tests, unit tests, while when they gave that functionality over to testing team, they again started doing the end-to-end, -end. so it's been done twice now. You're basically doing double the work, you double the amount of uh, things that have to be maintained and changed in the future. Again, another anti-pattern, but fairly realistic. We all have to face with that. Again, I'm not proposing everyone being following the test pyramid. It's not exactly real, but that's how we usually work with. And I'm, I'm personally working right now with the ice cone. 
That's an unfortunate thing, but that's the reality. So what I'm trying to say is we need to change that, at least step by step. I'm not saying just set everything on fire and start from scratch. At least let's go for the better approach. And this is where we have to establish the context for today. We will be testing something in a sense that some of the tools or frameworks I'll be going through will be focusing on a particular use case. And that use case, uh, for the sake of simplicity, I will be doing to-do app. I, I love to-do mvc.com. But I hate the lack of contrast. As a result, it looks awful on the screenshot. But basically, I have this app running on my local, or in this case, for the production, I have it running on Oracle Cloud. And then, basically, it's simple to do app. You can add another different items, change their state, delete, add more, and so on and so forth. Simplest thing ever. Great for great for representing and testing something, or at least for giving a talk. So, in terms of applying testing to this to do app. We have to consider the first case, because context matters. As any consultant would ever say, you know, it depends. So we have to establish the first case. The first case will be fairly common. You have an app with the backend written in Java or whatever you use, maybe C Sharp, or it can be hundreds of thousands of things. Thousands probably exaggeration, but still, there are different ways to do the server side. But let's say it's Java. Often, more often than not, when developers work on backend for Java, even though it's they're doing the web app, testers end up writing their end-to-end -end tests in Java also. And I would say, you know, people might be saying, is there even a problem with that? Basically, having the dev team writing Java and testers writing Java. Unfortunately, I would say yes, there is a problem. And it took me a while to get to this idea. And what I'm trying to propose here is that you're supposed to move away from writing tests for web in a backend, while the backend might still exist for your uh, web, uh, for the developer team. they most likely writing you know, the, the web services on a backend. It's great to test them in isolation. You can use REST Assure for your REST API or whatever web services might exist there. But if you're testing web, reg regardless of what the backend is written in, as long as most of the web, the actual UI would be written in some sort of JavaScript. And that's why I'm proposing to move away from the backend and to give a bit more contextual approach here, just to basically highlight what I'm trying, why I'm even proposing this to move away from the backend, is because, again, the hybrid model is important. I'll talk about that in a second, what the hell this even is. The main driven design is kind of been more popular lately, and I have to say a couple of words about that. And the last point, again, if you're trying to do web testing, even in the lower level of test pyramid, you still have to keep it very user-centric if you want to minimize having this reverse pyramid use case. So let's talk about the hybrid model for a second. Hybrid model is just a fancy way to call people who do both development and testing. The, again, the West Coast and the, in the U.S. especially trying to popularize it heavily. Regardless of the name, the idea behind it, again, is the fact that we have everyone software engineer. You don't have different titles. You don't have the separation between the team members. Everyone is a software engineer. But the whole idea is that they're supposed to know software principles or how to basically write software to begin with. And also, they should have a testing expertise. More often than not, as I've mentioned, People focus on the fact that you should learn how to code, but they forget to teach them or at least go through some training on the testing practices. And they just, they just think they know how to write Java. Let's just let them write Selenium WebDriver tests in Java. Uh, it's, it's simple. But they don't introduce them to the idea of you need to understand that if only like 1% of your customers go through a particular login authentication flow. You should not be writing end-to-end -end tests for that. You should focus on the very like you, you know generic or main use cases and only do that because it will cost you money. You don't want to spend most of your time, and I've done it, I've spent most of my time fixing tests rather than fixing bugs that these tests should supposed to uncover. You don't want to have that and you have to focus on testing expertise. Hence you should really go away from just focusing on the back end and do more of the client side testing. I'll talk about that in a second. The main driven design, that it's, it's might sound complex and the books are usually that thick. Uh, it might be hard to read about on that, but there are two main ideas. is the fact that you have to enforce ubiquitous language. In other words, it's the language that works everywhere. It's the same language that the entire team communicates in. 
For example, if your developer creates a class a production uh, you know, in production, they have a class called customer.java, if it's in Java, but your testers uh, write a te a test account.java. Now, when you have a team, new team member coming into the soft, uh, to your code base, they look over, they see that you have a customer and you have a test account. And you think they basically have to have this conversation between, between uh, the team members, basically translating the idea that, oh, the test account is actually testing a customer. Why do we have this complexity? All of everyone should talk the same language. You have a customer, call it test customer Java, or just create a pa sub package in it under the test directory and call it a customer Java. Have the same language. You don't have to waste time on communicating this translation when the new person comes in, or when you have a meeting, or, or so these sorts of things. Uh, the same way, the same reason here for the coding. When you developers for the client side, for the for the end user, they're writing the UI in the client side code in JavaScript, it makes sense for testers to use the same language to test the web. Because again, ultimately context matters. If you're residing and your users mostly residing on the client side, on the UI, focus your testing on the UI as well. And again, last but not least is this concept I've been talking about a lot, is everything is user centric. When you talk about web, context and web testing, it's all about trying to keep it concise and for the sake of the, of the user. Otherwise, you'll again end up with just writing end-to-end, -end, thinking that it's only end-to-end -end that's supposed to be user-centric. No, the whole web test pyramid is supposed to be user-centric. Again, if you're still not convinced, it makes sense. It took me a while to even think about going back, because I've written a lot of Selenium WebDriver in Java. Um, it's that whole thing with this talk, even the title of this talk, the modern web testing. When it comes to web today, as much of you know, web assembly and other languages coming, coming up, still the JavaScript is kind of a, you know, a language of the web to some extent, at least of the UI. And it's very powerful, especially if your testers still are just undergoing this kind of transition to maybe writing the testing in the client side side. I want, to introduce, I want to basically explain that the learning curve is quite flat. It's not that steep, it's not that difficult to transition, because even in JavaScript, for the st tester's sake, you have a great assertion libraries available to you of all kinds that follow the same exact patterns. Every test that you ever write follows three simple principles. You arrange the test data, you act on the test data, and you assert it. That's it. Three A's. It's very simple. Most of the tests, I don't want to be extreme saying all, most of the tests will follow this pattern. And the tools are there for you to write it that way. There are process libraries. If you're following a specific methodology, JavaScript will allow you to do that. And of course, Enterprise acknowledges the importance of JavaScript, even in the testing aspect, and provides you with some libraries. To give you a couple of examples for the assertion libraries, of course, there will be things like Chai and Jasmine. You know, I, I feel like whoever was naming them was very thirsty and everything we had a name of that, of that sort. The process libraries, if you have a behavioral driven kind of a team, and I really want to talk to you first of all because I've never seen that working, but if that's the case and you have a team that follows BDD practices, you have libraries like Cucumber for JavaScript as well. You don't have to make that complete transition for your team. And enterprise, if you're doing visual testing, there is a great company called Apply Tools. They have support for visual testing. Also, and of course, there are other frameworks and uh, libraries that cover all these three main highlights. So, <clears throat> speaking the language of the of the web overall, of course, I'm talking about JavaScript, and in particular, it's going to be Node.js. Most of the things I will be talking about today, in terms of writing tests for the client side, will be using JavaScript, in particular Node.js. So, when it comes to Node.js and why we choose Node.js to begin with, it's because it's great. I mean, it's isomorphic. You can uh, write code for both, you know, the server side and client side easily. You can, it's fairly flexible. Again, fortunately, it's because it's highly customizable. All those libraries, or if you're used to writing Java, it will be somewhat similar in the sense that the same way you had import statements in Java, you can technically, you can basically import and use different libraries in your JavaScript, in your Node.js, so your team would not have to go through the struggle. There are some complexities, obviously, in Node.js. Fortunately, the tools and things I will be showing today, they will cover them, especially the idea of synchrony and how to write code from top to bottom uh, the way we do it in Java. 
Fortunately, for the tester's sake, or whoever is going to write your tests, they will, again, would not have to be introduced to those complexities because whoever creates the libraries for testing uh, thought of that, ma making sure that, again, learning curve is as flat as possible, so you can make a transition much smoother. The, and again, I used to, I wrote it when NPM was the only way to manage those packages and customizations. Now there are lots of choices. But by lots, I think at least three. <laughs> Still, good enough, good enough number. That being said, again, it's highly, um, it's very, um, you know, big community around the customizations for this language. So, going back to the pyramid as a whole, to the test pyramid, I have to basically talk about it in context of the web. So let's talk about web test pyramid and how do we apply it to our uh, web applications. The web test pyramid doesn't look any different from what they used to have. It still have unit tests, they still follow the principle of low cost, high speed, and the low fidelity. So, looking at unit tests in more details, in particular, again, in the web context, uh, we'll, I'll just show you an example of Jasmine, how Jasmine is used for the writing, basically, uh, unit tests for your client side. That application I showed you, the to-do application, to-do MVC, it's nothing special. You, for example, you would have a function, JavaScript function, that doesn't do anything complex. It doesn't even matter what it does. But ultimately, it takes an input, it does some transformation to it, and returns you the, the output of some sort. Again, it doesn't really matter what it does. What I'm showing he here is it's a fairly simple function. But if I wanted to test this function alone, I don't have to write you know, tests for the web services. It's fairly simple. It's just transformation on the client side. I want to just test that function alone. That's where I would use Jasmine for that sake. The same way, I would basically have my uh, code where I you know, initialize the test suite. You have to name things properly. You, know, you, you have a test suite initialized. Then you would initialize a particular test case. Never name your tests the way I did it here. Valid, valid data, what the heck does it mean? Don't call it that way. That being said, it's important to name your tests properly. But again, what I'm trying to show here is your testers will follow the same practice they follow today. So nothing new here. And the same thing, the same three uh, principles. You try to arrange your data. By arranging the data, you basically have a test data of a name of your to-do item, brainstorm ideas, and also the state being incomplete. You arrange it. You act on it by invoking create to do item, and then you do assertion. Same three practices, same three principles, uh, just using Jasmine rather than using your old, good old Java, C Sharp, or whatever you like to use as your testing team. So they can, they can now test part of the UI, part of the client side, without actually writing the complex end to end test automation. So we're kind of, again, stepping away from this reverse pyramid, at least a little bit. We don't have to always write those tests. For the integration tests, we also have better things to do than just writing end-to-end -end tests over and over again. Fortunately enough, in a web context, it's been you know, well worked on. There are lots of great tools these days, but one in particular, if you haven't been introduced to, especially the conceptual idea behind it, is Jest. I hope I pronounced it right. If I don't, I apologize. That being said, it's a great open source library from Facebook where basically it does a lot of thing, cool things. But in particular, I want to introduce you to the concept of snapshot testing, which I'm sure you've heard of to some extent. If you haven't, again, it's a nice way to test your application. And I'll talk about some of the use case in a second. Uh, imagine you have a React application. I, the, same, uh, the same thing about our to-do app, the to-do MVC. You have a simple a component that creates a to-do item. Nothing special, just a button. Basically, it generates you a uh, so-called virtual DOM. Uh, you don't just write HTML, you write it in this fancy way. And ultimately, it en ends up having the HTML with some styling on it. Uh, you also have a styling here also. So again, doesn't exactly matter what this thing does. What matters here is just a simple component with a button uh, and the styling. Again, to test. The, the, this functionality, we don't just have to write end-to-end -end tests, we can do some snapshot testing. And what snapshot testing does, it's rendering this component, saves its state as a snapshot file, it takes a snapshot of that virtual DOM, and compares it uh, to the later, later state. I would say when you're actively developing something, it might not be the best choice to use the snapshot testing, but 
It's a great tool for legacy systems. If you have a components that you don't work on as much, but you want to have a regression suite on that, making sure a styling hasn't changed, the HTML hasn't changed. That's what we often use end-to-end -end tests for. We're trying to write a bunch of regression suites to make sure we don't regress anything. It's exactly the same idea of handling legacy code, but you can use snapshot tests for that exact um, purpose. So that's quite a good replacement for end-to-end -end tests. So in terms of the tests themselves, they follow Usually, they follow the simple practice of, you know, you initialize the component you want to render. You have like a um, testing util renderer that helps you with that. You initialize the test component. Uh, you save it as a snapshot, and you make some assertions. Nothing special. Very simple lines of code, just three lines of code, basically, that you do over and over again. You can make, of course, more complex scenarios, like you want to press something, changing the state, then taking a snapshot. You can also do that as well. And it ultimately produces something looking like that. It's basically a quick snapshot, including the styling, HTML itself. You can see how nicely it basically looks like. And you can, again, maintain legacy system pretty well with that, avoiding, again, a bunch of legacy system end-to-end um, -end tests. That's already a good step towards the right direction. But overall, we have to reflect on those two levels that I've talked about. I talked about unit tests following these three simple principles. I also talked about integration tests somewhat briefly. But you have to understand that both of these levels, they had only one focus. And that focus was developers. As much as I try to highlight everything supposed to be directed towards the user, for those two levels, again, the same idea. They mostly uh, focusing on giving a very quick feedback to your developers. They're basically talking to the developer because they're focused on developers. And oft, more often than not, developers end up writing those unit tests and integration tests. If you want to make it so people do it, try to make it you know, pleasant and ex good experience. And hence, those Jasmine and Jest try to focus on that quite heavily, making the development process of those tests and running those tests somewhat pleasant, I would say. So, again, it's a good focus to have on developers because your developers should be happy. But for end-to-end -end tests, again, the focus should be slightly different. And that focus, of course, is something I already mentioned. It's a user. So, let's talk about end-to-end -end tests now. They're the costliest, they're the slowest comparing to other levels, but they give you the highest level of fidelity because it's real customer use cases that we are testing, hopefully. So. With that being said, an important idea that I already highlighted is that you're supposed to shift your focus. Don't just do it for developers' sake anymore. You have to do it for customers. On this level, it's all about the customers. As much of the previous levels, supposed to keep them in mind. You can still go a bit overboard, especially with the cheapest unit tests, testing functionalities that your customer might not even talk, work with, but just the unit of works that your developers are working with. But for the customers, for the most expensive end-to-end, -end, you have to only do what customer uses. Because basically, ultimately, this is where the money are coming from. So it sounds great to make the shift, but how do we actually do that? Of course, it's that shifting this idea of just having the end-to-end -end test to have end-to-end -end task tests. Basically, or other terms you can call it, again, user-centric testing, rather than just calling it end-to-end -end flows. Because end-to-end -end flows can be something more generic than that. Instead of focusing on interactions, you are focusing on the tasks. In the more technical terms, if you're doing Selenium WebDriver, you've probably heard of page object model. Instead of focusing on that, what you're supposed to focus is something people call sometimes screenplay pattern. I'm not going to go into much details. I'll just explain it in the simple terms. For example, let's say I go through authentication flow. Have authentication flow is as a person who writes the test, write my test code. Uh, I want to test a scenario where I enter a username, I press submit button, I'm supposed to have an exception, you know, password is missing. So, a simple flow. If I were to write page object model, very interaction driven tests, I would have something like, you know, find selector by the CSS class username form. Then I would have again another more very technical kind of API called send keys, username. Then I would have find sele by selector, submit button, send keys, enter. 
you can hear that it's even complex to follow because of the way it's, uh, it's focusing this interaction step by step. If I focus on the tasks instead and approach it as a user would, as much as I don't really trust in the BDD sometimes, I still value the idea of communication within the code because we talk code. So if I write my tests in a way of tasks, I, I should be able to even show it to the users sometimes. So if I were to write this flow more task-oriented, I would say something like I have a login form that accepts and it has two arguments, you know, username and password, where password is optional. So I just say login form dot accept, send the username value. Uh, login form dot submit. So basically it's exactly what the user would do. They would, they would, they would send the, the values and they would send the submit. They don't want to care, they don't care about send keys, API calls, all of that has to be abstracted. And so that's why you focus on these kind of task-oriented tests, just the way when you communicate between developers and testers. Nothing special here either. It's a very simple idea. But going back to the app and away from this theory, in end-to-end -end testing, what is the co most common way to write end-to-end -end tests? Of course, it's a Selenium web driver. Selenium web driver is a great thing. I'm not saying it's bad. What I'm trying to actually highlight here first and foremost is it's a de facto end-to-end -end tool. It has done so much good for us in a sense that it established testing standards. Now it's hard to see the testing position that does not require Selenium uh, expertise, or at least that you have tried that in the past. And it's a great thing. It really empowered us in terms of web testing. And you can deny that. People who do, I don't want to even talk to. Um, it's a very generic tool in a sense that it covers a variety of scenarios and use cases. So that's great. Um, and it has lots of integrations. Lots of open source and enterprise level integrations. Produce lots of businesses for people. Again, a great, great thing for the community. And uh, you know, when, when it comes to architecture, in the simple terms, you know, I'm not going to go into details, but it's uh, after a lot of great work that the, the, the community has done, you ultimately have bindings for the browsers. You have a very generic Selenium remote server that you have language bindings for that, fortunately enough, does not uh, bind you to one individual language like Java or C Sharp. You can do a variety of things, and that's one of the great things for your testing team or development team because you now, you know, you have a choice. So whether you're testing for individual browser or for all browsers and what language you might, might want to use. Again, nothing special here. So, because I've, I've talked so much about moving away from backend testing, I want to talk about how do you do the Selenium web driver for client side. Web driver JS, and it's very important to have JS capitalized like that, because JS, where both are capital, is a different framework altogether. So be very careful with that. Naming thing is, things is hard, and the Google still has not updated the, the indexing. So JS, where the S is small, it's basically referring to Selenium Web Driver JS. It's the same team, Selenium HQ, and the community that works on regular Selenium. Uh, they also have bindings for the client side that again follows the same best things. It's de facto tool because it's still Selenium. It's a testing standards. It's very generic and it has lots of integrations. So a lot of awesome things. But ultimately, what it actually is architecture-wise is the same old thing, same browser binding, the same remote server, but the language bindings are only for Node.js. You write, you again, using the client-side language, the JavaScript for writing your tests. All right. So, when it comes to writing WebDriver.js, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to teach you how to write those tests. I'm trying to highlight how easy it is or comparable it is to what you might have used to by writing the tests in the backend way using Java, whatever language you might have used on the backend for your web, web, web services or things like that. So, first and foremost, of course, you name your test suite. You have some language syntax that you have to kind of follow. I've been said, you just name your test suite. Then, kind of a verbose, but it's okay. You initialize your driver the same way you would when you do anything like Java or C Sharp or whatever you might use. You have to initialize it and you have to clean up after yourself. And it's always good to clean up after yourself, whether you're writing code or going for like kitchen in an in office or something like that. So it's important. You should not forget that. Then, of course, the most important thing is to write the test case itself. Again, naming is important, but nothing special here. The same way you would call a create a method in your test class uh, would be the same way here in the eat statement. So you have an eat clause and 
you go to the URL, so you basically try to kind of arrange the data. Then you try to act on it, you find the element, and you send some keys to it. The same way you would do it in other languages, in Java or C Sharp, nothing new here. And you do some assertions, you look for some elements. Again, I'm not trying to teach you how to write this code, just highlighting how simple it is and look, look alike it might be to the other languages you're used to. And again, same three principles. Arrange, act, assert. Nothing new. So trying to show that the, the curve is still flat. Unfortunately, it's not just the good parts when it comes to Selenium or any sort of testing, but in Selenium in particular, we have complexities in end-to-end -end testing as a whole, but in Selenium as well. So, in general, there are complexities of how do you find elements? So, what does the selectors would be? How do you find them in the begin with? What's going to be your locator strategy? What do you find them by? How do you write the code in the first place? What is the test flow like? Is it asynchronous? You have to do the callback craziness, or you do the, you know, the synchronous flow of data that's much, much easier to follow, especially for people who just uh, enter into the IT industry. So that's very important idea as well, an important complexity to think about. And uh, what kind of single page application framework is it built for? Is it generic or is it very specific to uh, React, Vue, or whatever it might be? So let's try to apply and consider WebDriver.js with those four principles. Selector-wise, it's nothing special. The same old ID, CSS, XPath, name, and so on and so forth. Nothing new here. Locator strategy, the same old by locators, you know, by CSS name, by ID, by XPath, same old selectors you might have used in other languages. Test flow, we used to have something called the promise manager that would force synchronous flow of you writing code top to bottom. Fortunately enough, these days they've deprecated that, and, but they still kept this synchronous flow of writing code top to bottom. So it makes it much, much easier for people to follow and write the code, which again is important. If you're testing a complex piece of code with even more complex tests, you now double the complexity. I would rather not write tests to begin with if it made my application even more complex. It has to be simple and easy to follow. Hence, you have more synchronous flow. Because just by our you know, nature, we're kind of more used to following just top to bottom or like synchronous flow of information. And SPA type-wise, it's very generic, as I've said. Whether good or bad, we, have to, we can discuss. But the fact that it's generic and what I'm going to talk about now, it's making it quite limited, I would say. Because if you consider different use cases, there might be something better. And there's always a good question to ask if, if there is anything better. For the another use case, another special case that we need to consider, let's consider our app being Angular app. Not just something generic, but Angular. Of course, when it comes to Angular, I'm not going to go into details what Angular you know, implies, but one thing I have to mention. With our demo app, with our to-do app, we have a bunch of weird you know, ng selectors. So basically, you have ng submit, you have models, you have classes, you have repeaters, and a bunch of Angular-specific ways to interact with the HTML, basically, basically bind it. You would have sometimes a hard time handling this in regular Selenium WebDriver.js. Hence, we have to look for something better. And when it comes to testing Ang Angular as a whole, of course, we would still test unit tests. We'll still have integration tests. But for the end-to-end -end tests, I want to say that there is something better we can do than just WebDriver.js. And that better is Protractor. Protractor is a great tool for the end-to-end -end testing for Angular apps, developed by the same exact team uh, that works on Angular. So, it gives us a lot of benefits, and one of those benefits is coming from the way it's structured, the architecture. You have everything WebDriver.js has, and then some. And that some is basically some additional API bindings for the Angular. That's all cool. You still have the generic Selenium server that everyone would use. But more importantly is the last part, that Angular tells Protractor, I'm done rendering, I'm done loading the app, now go ahead and test. Because one of the main concerns and issues with end-to-end -end tests is flakiness. It's basically the fact that your tests are non-deterministic. You can't tell, you know, you basically have a test that fails once, but 
passes the second time, or it fails on the continuous integration server, but it's working just fine on your local machine. There's nothing worse than that, because basically it becomes non-deterministic and giving you no benefits whatsoever. And so by handling this loading process, knowing exactly when it's ready to be tested, you're handling that problem. So that's awesome for this exact scenario. And looking back at those complexities I've talked about, selector strategies, flows, and uh, what kind of spa type it handles. For protractor, you still have element bindings. So you can uh, uh, bind to IDs, XPath, and CSS, but also additional things like you know, by repeaters, by models, or other things, and I'll show it to you in a second. The test flow, it, again, it only will start uh, running your test when application is ready to be tested, when it's loaded, and, you know, can be looked at. So, again, handling this flakiness complexity, this flakiness problem, SPA type-wise, of course, it's oriented towards Angular applications. So, in terms of the example, the same old way. You name your test suite, you name your test case. The good start. Then you still go to the URL. So you start arranging your test data. Then you, you can see here, now we have by model binding. I go beyond the regular API of by CSS, by, by name, by, uh, by the ID. I go beyond that because I'm specifically using Protractor for Angular app. And then I still, you know, I do the assert. Again, the same three principles. I, now I do the assert, and here again I have better bindings. I can do specific bindings for Angular app. Still following the same principles of arranging, acting, and inserting. But much, much easier for me to handle because I know exactly when it can be tested. So Angular is great and all, but for the better or for the worse, there are lots of UI fr frameworks out there. There is obviously React, there's Vue, Ember, Backbone, and I, I'll probably spend more than an hour just iterating more from like the last couple that came up in a month or so. Because, you know, number of UI frameworks is just insane. So if you're just questioning, can I run Protractor with my React app? You sure can. The thing you have to do is in configuration, you have to disable synchronization. And that synchronization, what I'm referring to is basically that Angular app, I'm finished rendering, now go and test me. You can disable that, but Honestly speaking, it's, it's making it useless because then you can't really have those cool bindings by model, by repeaters, because it's not going to be applicable. You now basically have your old WebDriver.js API, but uh, with some unnecessary API hanging around for the Angular-specific binding. So it's really not extremely useful for you. So you have to consider that because now it's important. Do you go and commit to Angular by now writing your code in Protractor or you keep it more generic with WebDriver.js or some other tools because you're ready for the transition going forward? Or other choices might be, and you, have, you can be asking yourself what's next, especially in this, the modern web testing world. It's a non-Selenium UI test frameworks. And in particular, the ones I want to talk about is a test cafe quite popular one, and the Cypress I.O. I cannot skip Cypress I.O. because it's been so popular and talked about in length by many people. If we've learned anything so far, and I've talked about it repeatedly, is that we have patterns everywhere, in testing and software development, but in this particular case, even when you consider different frameworks or test frameworks. So, for common patterns, so those non-Selenium uh, test automation frameworks, we have four main principles or four main things I'll go over really quickly today. How do we handle weights? Because again, main problem people started going through and trying to tackle with these frameworks, how do we handle these flaky tests? When do we start testing? When do we know the app is ready, it's loaded, especially with these new and fancy frameworks? Can we run tests in parallel? Because we all know we have so many tests written for the in this UI, uh, for the UI. So we have to be able to run it in parallel or run them for different browsers in parallel, if that's possible. Rapid test development has been very kind of a hot topic as well. Basically, I want to see uh, my test changed uh, as I change the test code. Basically, the, the kind of a hot swap, you would, it's like similar to the hot swap in Java, uh, the same way I want to make sure that my test, I don't have to rerun the whole thing. I can just put like a stop there, change the test code a bit, and keep going and see how it changed my execution. So I want to be able to write it quickly. In that way, you can appeal to developers a lot more and get them interested and excited about that. And because we still have lots of manual testers, 
uh, and they are important. But people try to transition them slowly by introducing or reintroducing, I would say, recorders or basically, you know, record and play flow. I can press a couple of buttons, save it as a script, and rerun it later and have some automation in place. And it's been quite popular and emphasized by these non Selenium frameworks also. So, Test Cafe, let's look at that with those common patterns in, in place. For Test Cafe, it handles weights pretty well in a sense that it's actually, generally speaking, waits for the requests to complete. It follows basically our all X XHR requests are done, which can be tricky, especially if you have a streaming API in place that basically never completes. So you have to be careful with that. But generally speaking, it does it pretty well. It, in general, it really knows when the app finished loading because all the requests stopped coming. So that's kind of a good enough generic approach. Parallel execution, it's important to acknowledge they handle all browsers. You can run tests in parallel, but also you can run it for all sorts of browsers, including Firefox, not just Chromium-based browsers. Rapid test development, they have a great uh, kind of a IDE you can use with the test cafe. Um, it's called the test cafe live. And they also have recorder in place. If I were to show you an example of the code itself, nothing special there either. You, ch you name your tests, you choose what URL you want to tackle, what use case you want to tackle, and you, um, the same way you arrange your data and you assert the, uh, act on it and you assert it. But the way you try to write it is more of a kind of a kind of streaming API style where you basically do the or promise style of uh, API writing where you basically have the arranged data after that's done, you go to acting on it, and then you go to asserting that. So they try to kind of force you to follow these three main principles in an easy way without handling a synchrony to begin with. So nothing special there either. But I'm just showing you that the learning curve is still fairly flat for this framework as well. Test Cafe Recorder and IDE-wise, they have basically a very nice kind of drag and drop UI that helps a lot with the, especially for the manual teams. If, again, if you have them in, in your organization, in your department, you want them slowly to transition over uh, to coding or some part of automation, it might be a good thing to start working with that. This, is, this animation in particular taken from the Test Cafe website, they've revamped the whole website introduce lots of good documentation and you know tutorials i highly encourage you to take a look but it's you know they, they have some enterprise support uh but it's a nice tool it's extensively growing as well um and all those four aspects but the one again i have to talk about is cypress.io because again it's been discussed fairly uh, detailed in the past couple of years so when it comes to cypress.io and those common patterns i've talked about they handle weights in a similar way as Task Cafe does, and does it pretty well. If anything, I have to acknowledge it's a good tool to, uh, I, I encourage everyone to give it a try at least. Especially, not like saying, rewrite your whole test suite in using Cypress IO, but if you write in a new functionality, give it a try and see how that works for you. But something I have to say before even advising that is the parallel execution part. Yes, you can run your tests in parallel. You have different cases, different scenarios. You can run them at the same time. The problem is it still cannot tackle browsers that um, non-Chromium based. So you can't really run it for, like, say, Firefox. So, but you know, if you're writing a new feature or if you're more of a medium, st uh, medium size or, or startup, that's more than enough, I would say. If, but if you're an enterprise that has to support, for example, uh, if you work with some customers in some parts of the world, they still use IE9. I had to deal with it recently. If they use Internet Explorer 9, you can't use Cypress IO to support that and write automation for that individual use case. But there are customers like that. Uh, but in general, that should be good enough for sure. And I encourage you to give it a try. For rapid test development, they've done a great job on that regard as well. And if anything, I always give props for documentation. Cypress IO has one of the best docs I've seen. And the recorder ID, that's also available to you. Give it a try. Code-wise, if you were to write a code, looks similar to everything else shown so far. You have a URL you want to go to. You ha can find selectors. You can send data. I like how they can just uh, build in. You can retrieve passwords so you don't have to write them in the code and don't have to write these bindings by yourself. It's already built in. More importantly, they have more complex functionalities like working with cookies, already built in. So they've done a really good job with uh, making API user-friendly and developer-friendly. So that's always nice to see. 
but more importantly for the ID that you're working with, you can easily, you know, you can stop, you can stop the code in a certain point, you can change it, and that change would be represented in the test execution. And you can see the basic life. That's a, if anything, again, they've really done a great job for developer experience, and I highly encourage you to give it a try, at least to experience that. Maybe, you know, have it in your place, uh, workplace with whatever technology or language you use. But more importantly, and the last thing I will talk about is figuring out the right tool for the right problem. Don't just go for the new and shiny thing. Because, yes, there are many test frameworks, even the ones I haven't not, uh, mentioned, obviously. There is a WebDriver.io, there is a Nightwatch.js, WD, Nemo, and lots of others. You know, some people follow this resume-driven development. I want to create a test automation to have my name buy onto it, and then I will be famous. People, some people do that. Some people are most people are genuine and trying to improve the, uh, the world by having a new test frameworks. That being said, there are sometimes too many of them. What you have to do is to avoid tool mix-ups. Don't have a bunch of them because you have this complexity of in increasing the complexity. It becomes difficult to even you know, wrap someone up and begin. If you have a new hire, onboarding becomes a difficulty even with the testing because we use like Protractor, but there we use a WebDriver.js, and here we use WebDriver.io. You don't want to have to have that discussion. Focus on the production thing because that's what you're making money on. You want to make testing as efficient as possible because otherwise you would never be able to convince people to actually invest into that. There is no domain-driven design if you have a mix-up of tools because now, you again, you have no ubiquitous language even within testing team. Because different th tools, different frameworks will in encourage you and force you to use different APIs. Because no common language, no common language, at least even in the coding, code-wise, no API common language. And that's a difficult, and comp difficult thing to tackle. And how do you choose, though? It's always, you know, one thing people like to use, the GitHub stars. That's a nice enough matrix, I would say. You can see how uh, popular, and, you know, um, um, vibrant the community is, and that's always good to see. Some people look at number of NPM downloads. That also might be a good metric, but sometimes because continuous integration servers are the ones that download in the package, you're going to have an un unnecessary metric saying, oh, it's millions, and actually it's not. Um, but GitHub it starts, though, it's uh, real users for the most part. You can see, look at how many cost external integrations are built for a framework. If the enterprise come and play and build integrations for, let's say, Cypress I.O., it means it's going to get some traction because enterprise would not invest money in building any sort of libraries if it wasn't going to uh, be sustainable in the future. And always give a quick ex experiment, quick proof of concept before you fully commit. You know? It's like before, before you're going to get married, Date a bit, you know, you have to like give it experiment first before you fully commit. Always think about it that way. More importantly, and the last two points I want to make, it's about keeping it flexible and, keep, and keeping it to your individual use case. For the flexibility, cost of transition and return of investment is an important thing to think about. That's why I've been focusing so much on highlighting the flat learning curve. If the le teaching, re teaching your testing team or whoever writes tests is going to cost you a lot of money and investment because it's like completely new paradigm, it's going to be hard to convince and get the money for it. So think about that. Uh, can you even customize? Maybe committing to a Protractor because you're using Angular today, it's too much of a commitment. You don't want to have another dependency and an ability to change to React or other framework that will come out tomorrow. Think about it also. And how easy it is to replace? WebDriver.js is easy to replace with something, but that something might be more difficult to replace. So let's stick to WebDriver.js instead. So you have to think about that. And again, use case is important. Your team expertise. If you're Java, primarily Java people, like a, a, the t testing team and production team, writing JavaScript may be an overkill for it. If you're just doing API, of course, why would you even test UI to begin with? My team, I'm currently working with API core team, I'm lucky enough not to write any UI tests in the past half a year. I'm so happy. I haven't been happier in a while. Uh, you know, you don't have to even waste your time on that sort of testing. Focus on rest assured for your rest uh, web services. Don't even think about it. Uh, think about your application framework, as I said. If you are React, don't do Protractor, but do something else, like Cypress I.O. or uh, Test Cafe has quite nice integrations as well. And uh, can you in test infrastructure and handle uh, test framework that you want to choose. Think about that as well. So, with that, I want to end this talk by having a quick call for action. 
Try to evaluate your test architecture. Do you have this tool mix up today, or are you considering to introduce the mix up? Maybe keep it more focused than that. You know, uh, because ultimately it's all about the domain boundaries. Know where you are at. Try to at least talk the same language, even when it comes to coding, testing, and production code. Have the same kind. Even if you have two separate teams doing development and testing, bridge the gap at least a little bit. At least in terms of the. Uh, communication. Try to keep an, you know, take a note of how your meetings go. If I talk about the customer that Java and he, uh, he or she talks about test account, make a note of it and discuss it. Have the boundary in the same domain so you understand that. And unify your test strategy. Talk to developers. If they are considering moving to React tomorrow, but you are already committed to Protractor, have that discussion. Make sure it's valuable for them to know and for you to uh, consider when you're figuring out what uh, framework to go with. And the last, again, experiment. Have that spark all developers hopefully have. And I mean, you're in a conference. I would imagine you want to go far and beyond. So try out a couple of things before fully committing. And with that, I want to say thank you all for coming. And uh, we'll go to Q&A if we have time. But, or feel free to talk to me. But again, thank you so much. I know it's a choice, hard choice between me and the beer. I would not make this choice. I would go for the over there. I've been said, you can catch me up out there or talk to me now. I'm more than open to discuss. Or go here. Talk. And slides will be there on top. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to me if you like. Thank you. <laughs>